Welcome classic rock fans to the second episode of the history of Prague. As we established in that first seismic episode, progressive rock rises from the ashes of psychedelia. But whereas psychedelic music could often descend into this lysergic splodge, our neophyte Prague has favoured more considered compositions, more akin with art rock, which was soon to be termed progressive pop, which was soon to be termed progressive rock. There was always a pioneering spirit of that counterculture music, orbiting around the astral plane with Timothy Leary. We had Jimi Hendrix with his own brand of impressionistic blues, providing that perfect bridge between psychedelia, progressive rock and proto-metal. Needless to say, there was a lot of stuff going on that all melds into this uh, soup we now call progressive rock. There was the avant-garde, there was exotic instrumentation with bands like the Yardbirds, the Beatles and the Beach Boys. And there was an increased use in that uh, wonderful ethereal sounding instrument, the Mellotron, from those very fluty-like openings of um, Strawberry Fields to a sound that almost forms the foundations of the uh, those early Moody Blues albums with Justin Hayward. But let's not forget the Graham Bond organisation were incorporating the airy and spacey tones of this instrument as early as 1965. As I touched upon in the first episode of the influence of people like Bob Dylan, of course, there was this desire to elevate rock music to new levels of artistic credibility. But whereas art rock uh, was heavily influenced by the avant-garde, progressive rock uh, drew its influences from a more symphonic tradition, which, as I said before, irked Lester Bangs, who believed that rock music should always draw from that uh, African-American idiom. A philosopher once said that uh, innovation is the calling card for the future, and my word, the Beatles certainly left their mark on 1967. Uh, future proggers such as uh, Bill Bruford said without the Beatles there wouldn't have been progressive rock. But also in New York about this time you had that uh, uh, drone of the Velvet Underground as well as the Doors experimenting with those spacey and dark soundscapes. So it's safe to say that the USA plays a part in our narrative. In the USA there was a general moving away from the this counterculture idealism as the, the good vibrations of the collective loving ceased to vibrate, and the summer skies became clouded by events unfolding in Southeast Asia. And in the wake of uh, events like Altmont and the Manson murders, a lot of the, the hippie subculture, I think, began to be seen as um, perhaps idealistic fluff. And there seemed to be a shift from mind-altering psychedelics to other substances that usher in the paranoic miasma of the 1970s. The USA seemed to want to return to a more rootsy, authentic Americana, perhaps spearheaded by Bob Dylan decamping in Woodstock in 1966 with the band or the Hawks, perhaps as they were known then, uh, which ultimately led to the basement tapes, represented a desire for something more grounded. And in Europe there was this fragmentation, reassembling of traditional forms. It was a fusion of that psychedelic spirit of exploration with classical and jazz elements all thrown in for good measure. If you'll forgive me for quoting Wikipedia, Progressive rock came to be appreciated overseas, but it mostly remained a European and especially British phenomenon. Few American bands engaged in it. This is at least in part due to the music industry differences between the US and Great Britain. Cultural factors were also involved. US musicians tended to come from a blues background, while Europeans tended to have a foundation in classical music. And in 1968, Deep Purple, not a band we usually associate with prog, made a great deal of uh, John Law's pulsating and throbbing organ. And my word, try saying that and keeping a straight face. Henry Cow are noodling about in Cambridge, but it would be a few years before they release anything. And I've already spoken about the, the whimsy, wit and wisdom of those Canterbury bands. But for me, the seismic shift in our proc story comes in 1967-68, when the Nice released The Thoughts of Emily Stavjak. A band, of course, that uh, fanned the flames of controversy when they burnt the American flag to Leonard Bernstein, a rendition of Leonard Bernstein's America. But more interestingly, they included interpretations of classical pieces. Uh, Emerson, who of course was classically trained, wanted to incorporate these classical elements into rock. Procol Harum had already bludgeoned us with a bark with that iridescent hit of theirs. And the Moody Blues had uh, brought these symphonic elements into rock. However, I'm not convinced that the nice Procol Harum or the Moody Blues should be considered the first prog band or the first prog album. If I may, I'd like to quote from David Wagel's uh, excellent book. I hope I've said his name right, by the way. The book is The Rise and Fall of Prog. Prog takes classical structures, tonality and ambition and applies these to rock music. The Nice were doing something a little different in taking existing classical pieces and placing them in a rock, jazz and blues settings. 
While the use of an orchestra on the Classical Meets Rock Live album Five Bridges was extremely fashionable at the end of the 60s, the rock and classical sides of the music remained largely separate. But let's be clear, these bands are no doubt uh, significant signposts on the road to Prague. And the nice did see Keith Emerson develop that stage act with the first use of the modular Moog synthesizer on stage. But the Thoughts of Emerson's Davjack is largely a psychedelic album which employs many of those uh, post-Sergeant Pepper musical tropes. Also uh, some Hendrix style guitar from David List. David List was actually a uh, Pink Floyd guitarist for the day, I think, at one point. And Keith Emerson would develop that onstage persona, that maniacal Moog abuser, where he would thrash the instrument with various kitchen utensils, much to the delight of our Nazi and Proggers. Keith Emerson says in his autobiography that one of the nicest roadies at the time suggested that they use a couple of Hitler youth knives for the stage act. The roadie in question was Lemmy Kilmister. The nice were very much defined by those histrionic keyboard runs of Keith Emerson laying the foundations for later transmogifying horribly, according to John Peel, into Emerson, Lake and Palmer, a band whose music John Peel later described as total bollocks. But the nice had actually formed from the ashes of two touring bands. One was the T-Bones, the other was the VIPs, and they actually provided uh, a backing for P.P. Arnold, who had uh, secured a, a hit with the Cat Stevens number first cut as the deepest. But there is no doubt that the Nice laid down a clear marker and were an influence on European Prague. Bands including, uh, yes, uh, Triumvirate, Exception, Argent, Kayak, PFM, and many, many more. In fact, Melody Maker pronounced 1968 the year of the Nice. And any band that can incorporate the voice of a three-year-old child exclaiming, America is pregnant with promise and anticipation, but is murdered by the hand of the inevitable. Wow, heavy stuff, eh? And what was happening with some of the labels was interesting at the time as well. You had Derren, which was an offshoot of Decca. You know, they had the Procol Harum and the Moody Blues. You had Harvest, which was the more progressive wing of EMI. I mean, they, they boasted Deep Purple and Pink Floyd. And you had that gorgeous, swirly Vertigo label, part of Philips, I believe. And they, they boasted bands such as Coliseum, Uri Heap, Jade Warrior, Magna Carta, Gravy Train and Tudor Lodge. And of course, Robert Fripp was noodling about as well with his brothers, uh, producing an album, The Cheerful Insanity of Giles, Giles and Fripp. In 1968, Jimi Hendrix was joined on the US tour by The Soft Machine, who had just recorded their first album in New York, if I'm not mistaken. They were joined uh, by guitarist uh, Andy Summers, who joined them after the breakup of Dantillion's Chariot. However, Summers' tenure with the band would be short-lived after he was fired, apparently on the insistence of um, Kevin Ayres, who would later himself leave the band. And Tomorrow were an interesting psychedelic band as well, especially when they were joined by ex-Syndicate's guitarist Steve Howe. They had the honour, of course, of being the first band who did a session for John Peel. And in Britain, of course, you had the incredible String Band, with their own brand of droning, bucolic, mystical folk. I've got a list here of some notable releases in 1968. Excuse me if I miss a few out, of course. Of course, we had The White Album, The Zombies, Odyssey and Oracle, The Small Faces, Ogden's Nut Gone Flake. Pink Floyd released Sourceful of Secrets, that melding of um, rather disparate affair, that melding of some dark avant-garde textures. Uh, the Crazy World of Arthur Brown's debut, the Fairport Convention, July, the Moody Blues release In Search of the Lost Chord. Family released Music in a Doll's House, you had uh, the Procol Harum album Shine On Brightly. Jethro Tull released their Blues Inflected debut. The Gods released Genesis, Soft Machine's debut. And of course, let's not forget the rock opera SF Sorrow. Magma, the French progressive rock outfit, were founded about this time by um, classically trained drummer Christian Vander, but they wouldn't release anything until 1970. In Germany, you had a lot of bands emerging who were influenced by the psychedelic movement in the USA. Uh, these bands were called Cosmic Music or Cosmische Music as a, an alternative to the lightweight pop Schlager, as the Germans called it. And this music was dubbed Krautrock by the British music press. And just as we wanted to rest comfortably in the belief that progressive rock was essentially a European club, a band called Touch in 1969 released their debut album. Their Touch were a five piece that hailed out of Oregon. And their debut album sounds like it comes straight from planet Prague. You know, swamped with swirling Hammond, choral sections and over crank guitars. Yes, Kansas, a Uriah Heap have all subsequently cited this album as being a huge influence. 
and the sin came apart with Banks and Squire forming Mabel Grease Toy Shop, which would later become Yes, of course, incorporating the, the that balloon falsetto of the young John Anderson. Yes, of course, released their debut album this year, which included interesting choral sections, vocal parts, swirling Hammond, and of course the aforementioned Angelic Warblings. And another band released their debut album in 1969, which feels more like a pop album rather than the beautiful English pastoral music that they would become known for in the early 70s, and that band with Genesis. Van de Graaff Generator released their debut album, Led Zeppelin reinventing the blues with bigger amps and tighter trousers. And Deep Purple and Uriah Heat were incorporating that crunching Hammond sound into hard rock whereas Black Sabbath were down-tuning all their guitars, arguably inventing a whole new sub-genre of music. Other interesting releases in 1969 were Caravan's debut, Man's Revelation, the first Genesis album, of course, Who's Tommy Coliseum, for those about to die, we salute you, Amandul 2's Fallet's Day, yes, yes, released their debut, The Blossom Toes, if only for a moment, Can Monster Movie, Bloodwind Pig, A Head Rings Out, Jack Bruce, Songs for a Tailor, Soft Machine Volume 2, Bakerloo released Bakerloo and Kevin Ayers releases his excellent album Joy of a Toy. Wonderful review of that album is currently on my Patreon by the way. Pink Floyd released their rather messy album I'm a Gummer. And late 69 saw the release of that uh, genre busting Frank Zappa album Hot Rats. An album that was very important in terms of setting the template for his unique and rather strange career meshing highbrow and lowbrow forms. He remains a huge influence both to progressive rock guitarists and composers, I think, to this day. But something else seismic happens in 1969 when the Stones are blown off the stage in July in Hyde Park by a band that uh, is incorporating mellotron, strings, flute, the very dramatic and doom-laden vibe they had all melded beautifully with the mellifluous voice of Greg Lake. In the Court of the Crimson King was released in October 69 and no album had sounded like this. Owing as much to jazz as rock, the incendiary 21st century schizoid man kicks off the album with a plom, dominated by the heavy opening riff by Robert Fripp and the distorted vocal of uh, Greg Lake giving it that maniacal twist. I Talk to the Wind incorporated a beautiful woodwind section. Epitaph is grandiose and dramatic, dominated by that haunting swirl of the Mellotron and that amazing album art design by Gary Godber, which contributes to the decadent, disturbing atmosphere of this record. This album flip-flops between English pastoral, jazz, uh, classical motifs and folk modalities. The whole thing is textured in, in a way to lend this album a particularly contemplative palette. In my opinion, the Moody Blues and Procol Harum never came close to matching the complexity of this album. You know, they, they did incorporate symphonic elements into their music, but nothing at this level, in my opinion. And the first Yes album is dominated by the Hammond sound built around the, the choral sections of uh, Squire and Anderson, including you know, some cover versions. Harold Land is a typical piece of late 60s anti-war whimsy, I think. Although Survival could be considered the, the first bit of prog if you wanted to go there. But for me, prog proper begins when all the threads of everything we've discussed all twist and meld and announce themselves in this dark and apocalyptic offering. Pete Townsend describes this album as an uncanny masterpiece. And the music on this record is haunting and these strange lyrics, the ethereal trill of the woodwind flutes, it begets a kind of disorientating wooziness. If I may quote Luke Saunders, he says, uh, from the quiet spaces to the raging cacophonous peaks in the court of the Crimson Kings, a feat of sonic mastery. There's no doubt in my mind that in terms of progressive rock, this album lays down a clear and distinct marker. And with that concludes our episode two of the history of progressive rock. If you've managed to watch this video to this point without switching off, I want to thank you first of all for doing that. But hopefully you'll take a moment to like, subscribe and click that bell so you get notified of any future upload. But also share this video to any prog-minded people out there. Uh, also check some of the links below this video for ways you can support the sterling work done here at Classic Album Review. Become a patron. There's a fine body of work on my Patreon now. Or simply like the Facebook page. Uh, check out the wish list and all things like that. It's all good. So I'd like to leave you as I always do by saying I hope you are well and stay warm and safe. But more importantly that you... Keep listening.